Next up, a year ago today, a police officer killed George Floyd in broad daylight, a murder that was caught on tape and was later watched by millions around the world many times. His death fueled a summer of protests, making Black Lives Matter maybe the biggest movement in U.S. history and prompting a nationwide reckoning on systemic racism and police violence. We have seen efforts at police reform in some states, including this one, but little progress on that front in Congress. Then last month, the man who killed Floyd, ex-Minneapolis cop Derek Chauvin, was found guilty on two counts of murder and another count of manslaughter. But George Floyd was far from the first or the last, and the reckoning seems to be in the eye of the beholder as black and brown Americans suffer the most pain from the coronavirus, the economic collapse, and so much more. All of this, especially the unending violence by police, directed at those they're charged with protecting, has taken a major toll, as several of you recently shared with GBH News. Even before um, George Floyd, I would always tell my, my son is 13, he's the same height as me. You know, so he looks like a grown man. So I've been telling him since um, 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 Martin situation in Florida, don't wear your hood, keep your hands out of your pocket if the police approach you. You know, I've been training him his entire life. I understand the police have to do their job, but I also understand that, you know, I feel like I've always had to keep my, train my kids to be better, you know, and it feels uncomfortable. My concerns is I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to get killed over, over something that I don't need to die over, you know what I mean? Like, like just over racial profile, I don't want to, I don't want to get killed. George Floyd was uh, the middle of a period uh, of killings and certainly on the, the early end. Uh, of a string of killings, and so it's left me hyper vigilant because we've not broken any cycles uh, by having greater recognition of the loss of life uh, and the unwarranted loss uh, of life. There's a national anxiety, uh, I think, about when the next one uh, is going to happen. It's like really hard for hard for people to um, to act, you know, normal against. Um, I, I I think as police officers. Especially the guys, you know what I'm saying? They, they look at them a, a, a lot different. To live black is to live in fear in this community. But we live in fear day in and day out. I'm joined now by Dr. Charmaine Jackman, a psychologist and the founder and CEO of InnoPsych Inc. It's an organization that works to connect people of color with therapists of color. And Boston Globe columnist Janae Osterhelt, whose brilliant piece, I Too Rage America, appeared in Sunday's paper. Dr. Janae, thanks so much for being here. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Janae, for th those who haven't read your incredible piece, what's the year been like for you? Um, I mean, it's been, I think for so many of us, my year has been like a lot of us were just exhausted and uh, weary and heartbroken. And um, I think it's like you're wrestling to keep the faith. And uh, it's just, it's, it's it's a different type of tired um, and a different type of righteous rage. Um, I, I just, I just, it's been hard. It's hard to live it in real time and then also have to process it and contextualize it and write it in real time. It takes a lot out of you. you know, doctor, you see patients who are both adolescents and adults. Do the experiences they've described to you mirror what Janae was just talking about? Yeah, absolutely. There is a heaviness um, that people are experiencing. Um, the anger from the youth in particular, numbness. I mean, there's a whole range of emotions that people are experiencing. And there's some hope there, but there's a lot of anger, frustration, and change. Like, people just want change. You know, Janae, there, uh, there's so many lines from your piece that have stuck with me, but the one that I've read over and over again is this. It feels though America... Uh, has learned to value us in our deaths instead of doing the liberation work that would lead mm -hmm. to our long lives. There were many before him, but we like to think Floyd's lynching changed the world. In some ways it did, but the bodies keep coming. Mm -hmm. It seems to me that it's easier for us to focus on George Floyd because some accountability was exacted there. And to look at all of the other horrors is too messy and requires too much exertion of energy 
on the part of so many of us to do it. it, it does that ring true with you or, or, or does that make sense? I think people, I think it's easier to consider George Floyd an isolated event and to look at the verdict and say, oh, we won racism. You know, I got my participation prize. I went to the protest. I joined a book club. I read my way out of racism. And now we won um, because that's easy. And just kind of like it was all too easy for this to be our reality for generation, literally hundreds of years. You know, I reread Du Bois's Striving of the Negro, Strivings of the Negro People. He wrote that over a hundred years ago. And I quoted it in my in my piece. Mm -hmm. It's still relevant today. So rather than acknowledge these atrocities have been ongoing and that they continue to happen, happened on the day of the verdict and have happened every week since, it's easier to say, we did it. We can breathe now. Like it, it's 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 done. Versus to peel back the veil and peel back the curtain and peel back the horror that actually no, the framework of this country was built on these types of acts, and it's going to take a lot of real work and real um, power sacrificing and privilege sacrificing to actually reimagine what we need to be. Have you seen a serious indication, Janae, in this year? that white people in the, this country are willing to make that sacrifice and that, that giving up of power? I think that there are some white people that want to give up that power and want to really be allies. And But I think there's a lot more white people that want a participation prize yeah. and want to move on. Um, it's, you can, the response to my, my, column, my essay was so... Uh, Instead of dealing with the reality of what we're going through, so many white people are in my inbox like, I am not a racist and America is not racist. And it's like, if you can't read that piece and understand I'm not talking about any one individual and I'm talking about the country as an institution and whiteness as a power structure, not individual white people, this is why we have so many issues. People operate out of ego and out of power and out of optics instead of like, out of the real reality of the oppressive system we navigate every day. You know, uh, Doctor, I want to return to the line that uh, Janae wrote, the bodies keep coming. So do the videos. Uh, you know, we could go down the list, Laquan McDonald, Alton Sterling, Makia Bryant. I mean, it, it is endless. Mm -hmm. it's, it, it's sort of like this grotesque voyeurism, in my estimation. We didn't see George Floyd die once or 50 times. We saw him be murdered maybe thousands of times. What's the cumulative impact uh, uh, of that on black and brown people in this country, doctor? Yeah, so there are two things I want to just point around the video pieces. Um, the first one, I'll start before I answer your question, but I'll get sure, there, sure. is that the video, I think George Floyd is unique in that we saw the, his life um, be drained from him in that video. But where we haven't gotten justice is because our word is often not valued or taken as truth. So we often need some corroboration in order to get that justice. And I think that's a double-edged sword with George Floyd's, with the mm -hmm. conviction of Derek Chauvin, <clears throat> is that this only happened because there was this video that documented the entire length of his, his murder. And that's why we haven't really seen justice for a lot of other black and brown bodies who have experienced similar fates. Um, but back to your question um, around the collective trauma. I think what, what you experience and what we see is kind of the uproar, not just the George Floyd's, right? George Floyd was not the first pro protest that we had around the Black bodies. But witnessing that, um, when I heard it, I, I immediately envisioned my nine-year-old son, who was nine at the time, my, my Black husband. Um, I heard my clients tell me how scared they are when they're, their boy starts to grow a beard and a mustache at 13 or 14, right? That is a trauma that we have experienced for generations. And that is a trauma that we live with. And so that impact um, leads to depression, anxiety, sometimes a foreshortened sense of future or, or, or loss of hope. Um, it really, really impacts our, has impacted our communities. You know, uh, Janae, I used the term reckoning before, and I apologize. I meant to say would-be reckoning, because it seems to me this racial reckoning 
mantra almost glibly comes off everybody's tongues when talking about what's going on this year. Are we in the midst of a racial reckoning in this country or is, there, or is this moment about to slip by and we just move on to the next George you know, Floyd? I mean, we've already had so many more George Floyds since George Floyd. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we don't even talk about the Brianna's and the, the Micaiah's mm -hmm. and the trans, so many trans folks yeah. who are in their own epidemic. Um, so it's hard, you know, the racial reckoning, and I, I think we as a, as a collective community, as a global society, we get, we get these words and we just latch mm -hmm. onto them and they, they feel good to us. And we're, I remember when I first started in journalism, it was like racial tensions was a phrase that we thought, or that I don't want to say we thought I was taught to use. Mm -hmm. it's, not a good, it's not a good phrasing. And the reckoning, you know, I think people have to think really what that means. You know, to reckon with someone, something is to take into account, to account for it. And I don't know that we have shown, I mean, that's one case and one verdict. And unfortunately, we've had many videos before and still didn't get the verdict. So that was like a rare gasp of mm -hmm. accountability. So if it's just one rare gas of accounting for, can we really call that a collective reckoning? Because it's not. Like we're still we're still arguing about basic things like defunding the police, which doesn't mean take all their money. It means appropriating money for to help communities to better help and better source communities. You know, we we do it in the suburbs all the time. All of the suburban police departments are already defunded. They just don't use that language. Um, so yeah, I, I don't think we're really in a real reckoning. I'm not saying the moment's going to pass us by. I'm just saying I don't. I think we're celebrating prematurely. Dr. Jackman, I only have 30 seconds left, but to patients who have lived through depression and anxiety, understandably, we know the numbers have exploded uh, as a result of everything that's happened this year. Yeah. Do they believe there will be accountability, an accounting, a reckoning at the end of the day, or have they lost hope? Well, you know, it varies, right? It depends on where you're at in your that process. Um, Oftentimes, the hopelessness is its signature of depression. Yeah. Um, and I think it's 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 mixed. It's really mixed. I think people are holding on to hope. Uh, you know, I think Black and Brown communities have this this ability to compartmentalize, right? Mm. Otherwise, we would not have survived all that we have survived. We can put things in a box, and so that is some of the ways that we have survived. I am really trying to transform and think about a message of how we thrive, how we actually deal with the trauma, how we deal with the depression, how we access resources that we have said are not for us, that we can use those to thrive mm -hmm. and to move through this because we deserve better. You do deserve better. We all deserve better. Dr. Jackman, Janae Oster, help. Thank you. And again, please read your her piece in the Boston Globe. Good to see you both. Thank you. Thank you.